At 2 a.m., our commander came into our room and told us we had four minutes to get ready for the training session. Krav Maga, Israeli self-defense. Four minutes to change our clothes, grab the team gear, and sprint to the room, ready for hand-to-hand -hand combat training. Krav Maga had a legendary status as a unit. Every fighter remembered that first session, as we would remember ours. I spent the majority of that three-hour session in the push-up position on my knuckles. Uh, that was the punishment. If we looked the wrong way, we did the wrong thing. And I remember at the halfway mark, we were doing a water break. So I reached for the water bottle and realized I was unable to open my right hand. I had to use my left hand to pry open the fingers of my right hand. An unpleasant experience, to say the least. Um, so that training session took place in 2010, which was the year I drafted into the Israeli Defense Forces and began training for a counter unit and paratroopers. Experiences like the one I highlighted for you led me to two questions. One, which is the obvious one, why the hell did I volunteer for that? <laughs> and the second was, what is it for? Uh, with the benefit of time and reflection, I came to understand that many of the things that at the time seemed to be suffering for the sake of suffering were actually lessons in disguise. Among those lessons, resilience. The idea that with the proper sense of purpose, we can push aside our excuses. Now, when I think about my military service as it relates to resilience, uh, there's one particular week that sticks out for me, and that was the final week of our navigation training. This is me after 16 hours of walking, um, not doing so hot. Um, so prior to that week, I had gone to the doctor and told him that I was having some pretty bad pain in my knee, and uh, the doctor, through some tests, determined that I had a slight tear in my meniscus. So I went to my officer and said, I'm so sorry, I won't be able to complete this week. And he said, I'm so sorry, if that's what you choose to do, you'll be repeating the navigation training next year, as in the entire 12 week course. There's a few things that I hate in life more than navigation, to be quite honest. So, this was, this was not an option for me. Um, throughout that week, uh, I had 30 kilos on my back, and I walked 30 kilometers most nights. I was tired, I was hungry, I was cold. It was by far the hardest week of my life. I spent most of it dragging my right leg behind me because I was physically unable to bend. Um, that, that was the kind of pain we're talking about. And the obvious question is, is why? Right? I had plenty of legitimate or they made a legitimate excuse to just stop, ask to see the doctor, uh, be excused from, from completing the, the week. I had this um, image in my state of delirium that kept uh, coming back to me of, of a suicide bomb in a Tel Aviv cafe and this woman who emerges from the rubble, injured with dirt on her face, and she grabs me and she says, why didn't you stop us? And that was our job, we were counter and our job was to prevent acts against civilians and and the thought of that is what kept me going through that week and pushed me through it. So I did ultimately finish. Um, and this is another photo from that week, which we'll just leave out there because remember it the, of the misery. Uh, but resilience is, is really not unique to the military. Um, each of us can find resilience in our lives, provided that <clears throat> we understand our purpose. And as we discussed yesterday, what you do repeatedly becomes hardwired into your brain. So when you act with resilience, you become resilient. I was the 14th employee at uh, the company I now work for, Parachute Health. Uh, we were started because my CEO and friend's father took a fall needing back surgery, uh, did rehab, and the $20 walker that he needed never showed up. So he fell and landed back in the hospital. So my CEO created a platform to connect hospitals and suppliers digitally so that this wouldn't happen again. Um, and when I first started there, it was not an easy sell. People, as we discussed earlier, like what they know, right? And they know the fax machine, so they like the fax machine. They didn't want to stop faxing things. So day after day, I would show up at nursing homes in a very glorious way to spend the day and uh, sit next to these case managers and try to urge them to try our platform. I would send LinkedIn messages. Uh, I would do everything I could think to do to try to get this platform adopted. Um, and you know, when we think about the opposite of resilience, it's not usually just you know, this outright admission of failure. It's more often that quiet voice that just says, I'll do it tomorrow. And I heard that voice a lot. I'll make that phone call tomorrow. I already visited four nursing homes today. Why do we have a fifth one? Right? Plenty of good excuses, reasons to, to not follow up. But, but I did and we did it as a team. And we were persistent and we were resilient.
Today, we process 40,000 orders a month. Um, we have uh, the innovation departments of major health systems asking us to partner on co-developing IP. Many of those same hospitals I had to sneak into a year and a half ago to try to get me in. Um, so it's really been a remarkable turnaround. And the reason we were able to make it through those first couple of years is because we had a sense of purpose um, that drove us to be resilient. Um, resilience is really what happens when your belief in something is greater than the pain that stands in the way of you achieving it. And you know, we all have plenty of legitimate excuses in our day-to-day -day lives to not do the things that will bring us to our purpose, right? I mean, having a lot of kids, for instance, is a great excuse to not write a book. Having open heart surgery is a great excuse to not work out. Losing an arm is a great excuse to retire from the military. And yet, Tolstoy wrote War and Peace with 13 kids. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, three months after his open heart surgery, was doing two-day workouts. My friend Izzy, who lost an arm to a mortar, became the first soldier in the history of the IPF who was an amputee to return to full active combat duty. So the question is not how high is the wall, but the question is, is your strength and purpose strong enough to get you over that wall? And so my challenge to you guys today is twofold. The first is to write it down. Figure out what your purpose is, what the reason you have to be resilient is, and put it to paper. That could be in your role as a parent, at your role within your company. Um, and once you do that, just once each day, when that excuse pops into your head that might be legitimate, ignore it. I want to close with a quick story. Uh, there was a guy named Michael Morvan who moved to Israel from Philadelphia, and he decided he wanted to be a parachute. So Israel is a very bureaucratic country. You don't just show up at the drafting center and fill out thousands of forms first. But he showed up and uh, said, hey, I'm Michael. I'm here to draft into the parachute. Oh, that's very nice, Michael. Where are your forms? He said, well, I, I don't have any forms. The guy said, no. Go home and fill out these 15 forms. And by the way, you weigh 120 pounds. You need to be 150 pounds to be a parachute, so don't bother. Michael went around the back of the building, pushed a dumpster against the building, climbed in the second floor window, walked up to an officer and said, Hi, I'm Michael. I'm here to draft into the parachutes. And he said, great, where are your papers? Michael explained that he didn't have to be. And the officer said, well, that's impossible. You wouldn't have gotten in this building without papers. Do the front door. He said, who said I came in the front door? <laughs> so Michael ultimately made it into the parachutes, um, not because he didn't have legitimate excuses, but because he was able to push those excuses aside uh, in favor of a larger purpose. Uh, and my challenge to you guys is to think about what excuses you're giving yourselves that are standing in the way of you achieving your purpose. And now we're going to learn about what happens when teamwork makes a crash like that.